A very warm welcome on a very warm afternoon here in London to the School of International Arbitration's co-curricular seminar on independence and impartiality in international and investment treaty arbitration. We are delighted to see that so many students, practitioners, colleagues and friends of the School of International Arbitration have joined us from all over the world for today's seminar. I am Anna Howard and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the School of International Arbitration. Dedicated to the research and teaching of international dispute resolution, the School of International Arbitration was founded back in 1985 by Professor Julian Liu and Professor Roy Good. Since its establishment, over 4,000 students from over 110 countries have graduated from the school and 50 PhD students have successfully completed their doctoral studies. Many of our students go on to work in dispute resolution as lawyers, arbitrators, academics, or serving in international organizations. We are very pleased to see many alumni joining us today. I'm delighted to now introduce our exceptional and experienced panel for today's seminar. First, we travel virtually to Madrid, from where we are joined by Dr. Gabriel Bottini. Gabriel is a partner in the Madrid office of Uri Menendez and is a specialist in international arbitration and public international law. Gabriel has extensive experience of investment treaty arbitration, both as a lawyer and arbitrator. Gabriel was the first national director of international affairs and disputes of the Treasury Attorney General's Office of Argentina, representing the country in arbitrations administered by a variety of institutions. Gabriel has also published extensively on arbitration and international law issues, and is a regular speaker at conferences and seminars on arbitration and international law. We now move from Madrid to Paris, from where we are joined by Giselle Stevens Chu. Giselle Stevens Chu is a dual qualified French avocat and English solicitor advocate with over 16 years experience in international dispute resolution. Giselle has recently launched St Stevens Chu Dispute Resolution, a Paris-based disputes boutique law firm. Before launching her firm, Giselle practiced at Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer in the International Arbitration Group, first in London, where we met, and later in Paris as counsel. Giselle has deep expertise in both international commercial arbitration and investment arbitration, and has been recognized as a future leader by Who's Who Legal Arbitration. Giselle is also a board member of Arbitral Women and a member of the steering committee of the Equal Representation on Arbitration Pledge. Giselle regularly publishes and speaks on international arbitration and international law. We now move from Paris back to London, from where we are joined by Monty Taylor. Monty Taylor is a partner in the London office of Arnold and Porter, where his practice focuses on international arbitration. Monty has extensive experience representing clients in both commercial and investment arbitration, covering a wide range of sectors and he has been recognized as a future leader by Who's Who Legal Arbitration. Prior to joining Arnold and Porter, Monty served as legal counsel to ICSID at the World Bank in Washington. As legal counsel at ICSID, Monty acted as secretary to the tribunal on numerous ICSID convention arbitrations. Monty also regularly lectures on international arbitration, including, we are fortunate to say, at Queen Mary. A very warm welcome, Gabrielle, Giselle and Monty. And thank you for sharing your insights and experience with us today. I shall now pass over to Professor Stavros Brekulakis, the Director of the School of International Arbitration, who will introduce the important and intricate topic, which is the focus of today's discussion. For most of you in the audience, I suspect that Professor Brekulakis needs little introduction. Suffice it to say that he is a Professor in International Arbitration at Queen Mary University of London, where he teaches courses on international commercial and investment arbitration. He also serves as an arbitrator and is regularly listed in Who's Who Legal Arbitration. Professor Brekulakis has published widely on arbitration and has been named as a thought leader in arbitration by Global Arbitration Review. Over to you, Professor Brekulakis. Anna, thank you very much for this very kind introduction and a warm welcome to our panelists and our audience tonight. I'm uh, delighted to moderate with Anna the discussion of today's seminar on the topic of, in, of international um, arbitration uh, and impartiality, especially focusing on investment treaty disputes. As we all know, the dispute resolution system 
of ISDS. And I will refer to invest, investment treaty arbitration and ISDS as a kind of shorthand tonight, has been at the heart of continuous, sometimes heated debate, in particular in the last decade, and is currently the subject of uh, reform proposals, some of which include a shift from tribunal-based to court-based adjudication of all range of investment treaty disputes. Now, these proposals are partly in response to accusations of ISDS lack of impartiality. Accusations include that ISDS is structurally and systemically biased, typically in favor of investors and against states. These are also accusations there are also accusations that there are financial incentives, including incentives for future and repeat appointments that influence the manner in which arbitrators decide IS disputes. Now, in response to these, a number of institutions who play a very important role in the field of international arbitration have taken initiatives to regulate the conduct of arbitrators and enhance confidence in the decision-making process in ISDS. A notable and more recent example here is the code of conduct for adjudicators in investor state dispute settlement, which was published by the Secretariat jointly of the uh, International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, the well-known to everyone exit, and ANCITRA, and includes a number of disclosure requirements for arbitrators, which arguably go a long uh, way further than the requirements for disclosure under the IBA uh, guidelines and conflicts of interest. Now, very interestingly as well, the code places a limit on multiple roles on the individuals acting as arbitrators, prohibiting them for double hatting under certain circumstances at least. So there's, a, there's an assumption that drives this new regulation that there is some truth in some of the concerns that have been mounted against arbitration, against investment dispute settlement in terms of lack of impartiality. On my part, I always thought that accusations to the effect that financial incentives and repeat appointments are mainly driving arbitrator's conduct were always too simplistic to capture the complex nature of decision-making process. I'm trying to speak here from experience in my work as an arbitrator, but also from the pre preliminary findings of our large-scale empirical project, which Anna, myself, and other colleagues from Queen Mary and Cardiff University are currently conducting. And very, let me allow me very briefly to say that we've been interviewing a large number of experienced arbitrators, reaching now 100 interviews, and the evidence that comes out from the interviews is that arbitrators are not dri driven by financial incentives. I mean, they accept that they may, there may be some unconscious biases, as we all have. We all come with baggages, as many of the interviewees say, including people that decide in judiciaries, but they all confirm, and genuinely, in my view, that they are all striving to do the right thing, which is to come to a decision on the basis of the facts and the applicable treaty. Again, viewing these facts and constructing the, uh, the treaty through the lens of their personal biases. So here is my opening statement, which I will first put to Monty Taylor. Monty, do you think that these concerns and indeed accusations uh, about lack of impartiality, and especially because of the party appointed system in ISDS are fair or are exaggerated, as I said? I think it depends on what you mean by a lack of impartiality in this context. And I, I think there is some muddiness when we talk about these issues. Uh, and I query whether we're talking about partiality with respect to the disputing parties themselves or with respect to specific issues, legal or otherwise. Because if the question is whether repeat appointees may be partial to their appointing party, that's inherently tricky to assess because we're being asked to distinguish between, on the one hand, an arbitrator holding views that might be beneficial or sympathetic to an investor or a state, and on the other hand, an investor being partial towards their, uh, their appointing party itself. In my experience, and it sounds like it, it's 
shared with, with yours and with the research that you and the center are doing. It, it's rare for an arbitrator to actually be partial towards an investor or towards a state. And in my experience, I, I have very rarely seen anything that could even approach that. And to the extent that it does, it tends to be obvious and, and not benefit the appointing party in question. We all remember with groans those bad questions you might hear in a, in, a, in a hearing. Of course, who knows whether that's indicative of a broader attitude, but uh, there are occasionally snippets that you hear in the context of hearings that, that create a concern from time to time. But the more likely scenario in, in my experience is that an arbitrator may hold views that would be sympathetic to the treaty interpretation arguments of an investor or a state. And that takes us back to the distinction I flagged at the outset. Is it partiality to a party or to a view? And if we're in the context of partiality to a view, that's often described as issue conflict, uh, which is also a difficult concept. Because prejudgment of a factual question, application of law to facts, I would agree that's problematic and enters into the world of, of, of prejudgment that could be grounds for concern. But the question I have is, would a consistent ruling on a legal question be equally problematic? Or would it simply be a consistent finding, which some commentators long for in ISDS, that, that very form of, of consistency. And of, of course, there's a difference between consistency through fealty to case law if a system of precedent is created and fealty to one's own views. But I do feel a little bit of, of friction between those, those two different types of, of, uh, of, of comments or concerns in different contexts. But I'm sure my fellow panelists will have views on this. I, I, I feel that the question as to party autonomy uh, is a broader one, and I'd be fascinated to hear the, the views of the panel on that as well. Well, thank you, Monty. I mean, we will come probably to the question of party autonomy later on, but I just want to dwell on this distinction that you made between uh, issue partiality of you know views as to a certain issue and views as to a certain party. And I wanted to ask Zizel, um, in relation to something that you also said, well, why is it problematic if someone has a consistent view on a legal question? And I want to ask yourself, is not exactly what judiciaries are supposed to do? Is that they, they decide typically on the basis or on the back of consistent jurisprudence on something? And if someone is selected to act as an arbitrator because of his or her consistent views on that, what would be a problem about that, why do we call it issue conflict in arbitration and we consider it problematic, but it might be perfectly acceptable in the context of judiciaries? Well, I, I think you've, you've really hit, hit the nail on the head here. And, and sometimes I, I wonder whether we apply uh, undru unduly stringent standards in the context of ISTS and investment arbitration when compared to what actually happens every day in the in the ordinary state courts, where you know, judges, are, you know, all judges are human beings. They they have their own views, uh, you know, on legal questions and and also occasionally political views. Uh, and no one seems to question their impartiality on that basis. So I think I think there has to be a bit more caution a caution caution applied here and I think Monty you know drew the distinction aptly between you know your, your capacity to maintain a, an open point of view on a particular question that you have to have to decide based on a particular set of facts as opposed to your, your general views on uh, points of law uh, which uh, you know essentially uh, facilitate a more consistent application of the law and, and greater consistency in arbitral jurisprudence. And would you think, Giselle, um, that the chairperson plays a particularly important role in, in ensuring impartiality? And if so, how does the chair fulfill that role? Um, <laughs> well, the, the, the chairperson uh, obviously is the master of the ship uh, and has de facto or even express uh, control over the proceedings and the decision-making process. So the chairperson has 
an extremely important role to play in, in guaranteeing impartiality on, on the tribunal. Uh, and, and I think justifiably so, uh, some have called for enhanced standards of impartiality and indeed disclosure on the part of chairpersons uh, for that reason. And what that means in practice or on, on a tribunal is that uh, the, the chairperson, well, on the one hand, has a special duty to you know, ensure a balanced discussion uh, and to engage with both sides' views, both parties' views, but also really engage with, with the co-arbitrator's views to build a consensus. But on the other hand, I would say uh, the president also needs to maintain some degree of independence from uh, his or her co-arbitrators uh, in order to, to maintain that impartiality and uh, to, to maintain control of the decision-making process. There's, there's actually an obiter dictum from the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which I, I particularly like in this context, which is that the uh, president, uh, the presiding arbitrator, maintains the intellectual mastery over the outcome of the, of the, of, of the proceedings whereas the co-arbitrators just contribute to the decision-making. And so it's really important to engage with your co-arbitrators, but maintain the requisite intellectual distance and to, to form one's own view. And I think what that means in, in practice is, yes, there must be collegiality on the tribunal, but collegiality has its limits particularly if you have co-arbitrators who are not uh, necessarily as partial as they should be. And in practice, when it comes to deliberations and drafting uh, the arbitral award, well, we all know that in theory, the uh, presiding arbitrator holds the pen on the award. Uh, in practice, it doesn't always happen like that, and busy arbitrators like to split the work. Uh, but uh, at all times, even if if uh, one of the co-arbitrators may take uh, control of the draft or sort of take over uh, an aspect of a case or, or an aspect of the drafting of the award because of you know, particular availability or expertise, but it is incumbent on the presiding arbitrator to you know, maintain control of the decision-making process of that, you know, on that particular issue. There should not be wholesale delegation of aspects of the decision-making. So I think I would really summarize that by saying the presiding arbitrator is not just an umpire but must form its own independent view. Zizel, I think you, you make a very valid distinction there between the role of party appointed arbitrator and presiding arbitrator. Uh, and I wonder whether Gabriel you have a great experience acting both as arbitrator and as counsel. Do you recognize this distinction? in the way that tribunals deliberate, the way that tribunals conduct the process. And if you think that there's a special role to be attached to the presiding arbitrator, uh, I wonder whether the special ro role can translate to his or her duty of impartiality. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, of course, I, I do see uh, that uh, position and actually, uh, I've seen very prominent arbitrators in deliberations actually expressly saying that they see their view as, as someone that must uh, ensure that the uh, arguments of the party that appointed them uh, are presented uh, and are considered um, in, in a fair way. Uh, and personally, I think that that's a very respectable and honest position which again, um, some prominent arbitrators are very open and, and say that's the way party appointed arbitrators should, uh, should act. I personally don't share that view, I think, not only because uh, of, a, of a illegal reason, I think the uh, standards of, of impartiality and independence are the same for the three arbitrators. And I, I don't think we should make a distinction there, but also because I think we should strive uh, that the arbitrators uh, consider, uh, the three of them, consider and address the arguments of both parties in, in a similar way. So I think that's the idea. I know that between the idea world and the real world, there's, there's a, a difference, but 
we still, I think, should try to, to obtain that. But again, I, I think that the other position is a respectable one. I think it's helpful, actually, to have an arbitrator uh, to present, uh, and actually uh, arbitrators, and, and I don't, I wouldn't like to offend any counsel, but sometimes arbitrators can be uh, better counsel than <laughs> counsel for the parties and can present the arguments in a deliberation in actually a more cogent way. So that's helpful, but but I, I still do prefer that arbitrators act, uh, again, are um, independent and, and impartial uh, in the same way. Of course, there is, uh, and, and there I agree with Giselle, a, a special role for, for the president of the tribunal. And, uh, and, I, and actually, it's very rare, I think, for, for the, uh, uh, the president to uh, um, let go uh, the pen. They, they usually are the ones that draft the awards. And of course, they have a, a privileged position in, in, in many respects. And, and I think uh, that's, uh, of course, the nature of the game. But again, uh, I would say that he is subject to the same standards uh, as the, the rest of the, of the, the co-arbitrators. Gabriel, I, I'm, I'm grateful to you for setting out the two different approaches that some arbitrators take. You say that I tend to take a view where party appointed arbitrators are entirely the same expectations to act as if not really remembering who appointed them. I think if I translate what you just said correctly, if I, if not, please correct me. But then you very openly said that there's another approach, which you said it's a valid approach, that some arbitrators without being partial, they will probably take a slightly different approach in the sense that they will make sure that at least the case of the party who appointed is properly ventilated in the deliberations. And I don't know whether I summarize the two different, you know, approaches taken by party appointed arbitrators rightly. That's, that's correct, yes. And, and if that's the case, which is, and again, I recognize in practice, I wonder this, whether the fact that the system of arbitration is quite open, allowing both approaches to take place, and we haven't actually come to an understanding, let alone an agreement of which approach is to be preferred or indeed um, expected. I wonder whether the party appointed arbitration system allows for so much uncertainty into the system and depends on the preferred personal views of individuals who are appointed as party appointed arbitrators to take different approaches and whether there's any problematic situation arising out of that. Monty, do you, do you think that there might be an issue there in relation to the fact that both approaches are open and considered potentially um, unproblematic in terms of impartiality standards? The difficulty I have with there being concerns about it is that there is a special alchemy with every tribunal and a, an arbitrator can bring a certain approach to deliberations and whether or not you have a difficulty with that approach, it will be policed in a way within the deliberations and whether it's through the chair or whether it's through the, the culture, the community of those three people sitting in that room may well respond warmly to that sort of approach where you have an arbitrator that presents the position of the, the party that appointed them, or they might respond poorly. So it's difficult to be bright-lined about it because I don't necessarily see that approach as creating a, a problem inherently within the deliberations. And it is something that could quite easily offend or trouble at a lower level, the tribunal that's, that's hearing a particular approach. So I, I tend to have the same, well, not concerns, but I'm not as in favor of that approach like Gabrielle, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily something that is inherently problematic because realistically, it's a part of the history of arbitration. And, and there are some forms of arbitration where you do have uh, more of a culture of particular arbitrators being appointed by a party and there being almost an expectation that they will act as a pseudo advocate within a court system, tribunal system. 
So I, in my experience dealing with deliberations, haven't seen it being a problem in the sense that it's not necessarily effective. So I don't think it necessarily needs to be regulated, which I realize is going slightly off, off piece from the question you asked me, but I'm not necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily see a problem inherently with the two different approaches. No, oh, absolutely. And I, I understand and I agree with the point that you say that there are some inherent uh, safeties and safety nets included in the system, especially in the deliberations, that would not allow an arbitrator, a party appointed arbitrator to take a different approach to, um, let's say, um, take a step further than what is expected from them. So I don't, I'm not so much concerned as to whether the outcome will be tainted. I'm just, asking whether the fact that we have a wide open system which allows different views might be difficult to reconcile with consistency in terms of decision making. To give you an example, in judiciaries we all know and we all expect every single judge to exhibit the same approach to decision making, taking a, 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 an arm's length dispassionate approach. Whereas in arbitration, we say that we understand if a party appointed arbitrator somehow takes a more, um, an approach that will make sure to ventilate the case of the parties. And where these different standards are to somehow disturb the balance of decision-making and the expectations of the parties. I wonder whether Zizel has any views or any comments on that. Um. I, I certainly have views. Um, and also, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Giselle, maybe that's another thing that you, I would be grateful if you can bring to the discussion, whether with your discussions from clients, you sense that they have a sense of what kind of arbitrators they would prefer, depending obviously on the case. But it seems to me that clients becoming, are becoming very sophisticated right now, and they come with views as to what kind if not what specific person, individual arbitrator they want to appoint, what other type of arbitrator they want to appoint? Well, I think it's fair to say that clients are still by and large uh, very uh, keen on party appointments and being able to select uh, a member of the tribunal. Uh, and so I think that reflects an inherent feeling or impression that that arbitrator will play some role in ensuring that their, their case and their position is probably heard and understood. Uh, that the question, and, and, and I should say, I think it's, 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 it's a justifiable concern uh, in an international arbitration in an environment where there are potentially uh, different legal cultures at play, uh, you know, pro multi-jurisdictional, you know, question, different applicable laws, different uh, technical issues, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so I think that that participates to the confidence that parties may have in the process to feel the feeling that their case will be properly understood. Uh, the question then becomes how active a role the party appointed arbitrator must play. And uh, as Gabriel has, has pointed out, there are different approaches. Um, and I think one, one issue I see is that, you know, there's a real spectrum of behavior of different, there's a real range of, of different behaviors uh, along the spectrum and, and some of it's acceptable, some of it less. So I think the position that Gabriel described of the party appointed arbitrator that ensures that their party's case is, is properly heard and understood. That's obviously clearly within the realm of the acceptable. Uh, where things become more problematic is, is when the arbitrator becomes an advocate or actively is actively seen to be maneuvering the case in a particular way. And, and I, I've actually seen both types of behavior on tribunals. I've seen, I've seen, you know, just to put it very concretely, an arbitrator intervene uh, you know, 
on, I suppose, in favor, in support of the party that's appointed them to try and rebalance the discussions when they feel that, you know, perhaps there's been too aggressive questioning from the, from the other co-arbitrator or there's a point that's not been properly understood. Uh, but then I've also seen party appointed arbitrators, you know, practically take on the role of cross-examining uh, cross -examining, uh, the, the, the opposing, that the party opposing uh, their, their appointing party uh, and, and really formulating questions in a way that, that shows that they have a, have a closed mind to the issue. And so I think in that context, if we all accept that the party appointment system induces some form of unconscious bias and therefore some, some conduct, you know, there's a spectrum of, of behavior uh, you know, in, in support of uh, the appointing party, then would it be helpful to perhaps label what constitutes acceptable conduct uh, within, uh, you know, within that context and what does not? Uh, and, and I just want to mention uh, very briefly uh, in this respect, there's, there's an interesting concept that has been coined by in a recent um, doctoral thesis by Karim El Chazli under the direction of Pierre Maillère, uh, which is this concept of vigilance where the party appointed arbitrator you know, is entitled to and, and should consider uh, where appropriate, ensuring that their appointing party's case has been properly heard and understood, but it should not go any further the party appointed arbitrator should not be seen to be sustaining or supporting a case in which, which they know to be wrong uh, and should be completely impartial at the point of the actual decision-making process. And Giselle, you touched upon a point which has actually been raised by one of the members of the audience on unconscious bias, uh, a point raised by Atul Nedi Yomvitil about um, that given that there may be these subconscious biases at play, um, however, the arbitrators are expected to be equally impartial against that backdrop and also your point about the differing nature of the role of the party appointed arbitrators. How do you view the proposals by, for example, Jan Poulsen, that all arbitrators should be appointed by an institution rather than the parties? Well, my my view on that proposal is it depends. It, it really rather depends on the on 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 the well. There there are two points really. One is the point I've already made that the party appointment system is something that remains desired by users, and certainly in the commercial arbitration space, uh, I see no reason for uh, you know abandoning it uh, because it's something that's desired by users. Commercial arbitrations generally concern private disputes between private actors. Uh, so why, why seek to interfere with the, the desires of users in that space? I think there's a different discussion when it comes to investor state arbitration because there you're dealing with states and questions of public law and questions of public interest. So I, I, I recognize that, that, that there the party appointment system is, can be perceived to be more problematic. Um, I, I think the, the other question is, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, whether whether parties uh, truly, you know, are happy to default uh, to um, you know complete institutional appointments. I think you know we've all had varying variable experiences with appointments by institutions, and some some of them have been great, others have been disappointing, and you know we've had clients complaining that. The relevant institution really hasn't understood what type of chair we need for this case. You know, we've, we've all had that uh, experience. So I think uh, perhaps more work needs to be done uh, on the side of the institutions when it comes to selecting uh, arbitrators. But at the same time, it's a question of practicality. I mean, who best uh, than, the, than the parties themselves to understand what types of arbitrators you need on a panel? to properly uh, understand every aspect of the case. It's very hard for an institution coming in with limited knowledge of, of what the case is about and what the evidence might look like over time and you know, what, what, what the particular skill set required might be 
uh, to be able to, to determine the ideal candidate in every case. But again, I just want to hedge that, you know, it's not to say that all institutional appointments are bad and uh, I, I'm aware of the considerable efforts made by institutions to, uh, to, to improve the range and diversity of their, of their panels of arbitrators. Yeah, Gabriel, we, I referred to in my introduction to the recent um, code of conduct, which is a remarkable achievement by Exit and Ancestral. And I wonder whether there's one thing that is not touched upon there, and maybe, you know, what your view is whether it, it should have been. And I'm referring here by repeat appointments, not necessarily by the same law firm or the same party, by groups of litigants in ISDS. And we know, all know, the discussion about certain individuals, the certain arbitrators being appointed repeatedly by uh, either the investor side or the state side. So the first question to you is, do you think that this is problematic if you have one individual has been appointed, you know, just for the sake of it, 20, 50, uh, 30 uh, times by a certain group of, of litigants? And if yes, you think it is somehow an issue, whether this needs to be addressed maybe in the future by uh, updates on the code of conduct. Thank you, Staros. I think that that's, that's a very good question. And, and I should say um, that um, I'm probably not impartial uh, on that uh, question because uh, in investment arbitration, I, I am usually uh, appointed by, by states, uh, although I'm now counsel for investors in many cases and, and I do also commercial arbitration. So um, you have to uh, consider my opinion in, in that light. But um, I think on the one hand, um, there might be a, a, a reasonable concern because I think we have to recognize that investment arbitration in, in certain ways is different from commercial arbitration. And investment arbitration, as Gisela was saying, tends to involve issues of public law and more generally of public interest, and then tends to involve arguments that in the end relate to your more general views on political issues, even ideological issues. And thus, uh, the way or your ideology, your political views in the end will inform or will have some influence on the way at least you approach uh, these problems. I should say though that one should not take for granted what an arbitrator will do because you might have a certain political views, but then on the facts of the case you decide. So um, yeah, I, you will be surprised more than once. But uh, you have that framework, which is, uh, which is real. But on the other hand, I would be um, very careful in, in, in introducing that, again, as a general matter, as a source of, of challenge, because I think we start to um, play with uh, the freedom of, of uh, thought and free, freedom of expression. And I think people should uh, you know, be allowed to have their own political views. Of course, I mean, one must be honest, this also has an influence on uh, you know, parties and who they appoint because they will tend to appoint people that have you know, certain ideas and will, one thinks, tend to be sympathetic to the views that are, uh, you know, serve that party's interests. But um, in the end, I think um, I, I, I prefer that, uh, again, people are, are free to think uh, as, as, as they wish. Uh, and uh, in the end, um, if, of course, uh, as, as Monty was saying, there is a, a specific, uh, an opinion by uh, that arbitrator or potential arbitrator on, on the facts of the case, then, of course, that's a different question. But on more general issues, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, go down that route. And, and thus, uh, to say that just because a person is, is being appointed by, by a state is a ground for challenge, I, I'm rather skeptical. Because, again, that uh, might just show the way in which that person thinks, and, and I, I don't think that's uh, should or should be a ground for challenge. It's a general matter. Absolutely, Gabriel, and I and I on a personal level, I would tend to agree with you. If anything, I think um, it is we need to encourage the system to be able to allow appointments that come from diverse range of views, and uh, including views that they, you know, some arbitrators think that they understand better how states work. It, it's not necessarily that they have a certain view towards sympathizing the, the 
the acts or, or omissions from the state, but some people that have worked in the state, um, and they understand that states you know, can take decisions in certain ways that include sometimes bureaucracy. And that's something, a perspective that should be um, valuable in the deliberations and therefore a valid reason to be appointed. And, and conversely, some people understand that, or they think that um, investors and investment um, is um, drives um, the um, international trade and it's a very worthy cause. And therefore, uh, that's another um, valid perspective to be uh, brought into the deliberation. So I think, you know, your view is certainly a valid, but I want to ask Monty in that context, whether you, from your perspective as Kams, and again, with your discussions with clients, do you have these kind of discussions with them or with, um, with partners in your uh, law firm as to whether it is a valid perspective to bring into the tribunal when you're thinking of appointing an arbitrator, either when you act on behalf of states or investors? It's something that comes into the play of your considerations? Uh, do you mean the perspective that that arbitrator yes. could bring? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, I don't think any party appoints an arbitrator with the hope of getting a vote in their favour from the point yes. of, of appointment. Uh, and to do so is asking for trouble on, on, lots, <laughs> on lots of bases. But what we look for as a, as a general a general rule, whether you're appointing on, uh, when you're advising a client to uh, appoint either an arbitrator from the point of view of an investor or a state is, will this arbitrator uh, understand the arguments we're making and ideally uh, have a view that would be congruent with it? Not necessarily has ruled in exactly the way that you hope that they would rule in, in the past and, and should do in the future, because to draw that line gets into a, a, a potentially difficult world. But having arbitrators that have a position or they've expressed views or written rulings or whatever it may be that are consistent with the types of arguments you may wish to run, whether it's about the right of a state to regulate or in respect of illegality issues, that's an important consideration that we take into account when advising clients. Uh, because what else can you do as in the, the the advantage of investment arbitration and and again the reason why it also gets criticized is that we have access to these decisions and these rulings that aren't it isn't the same in the context of commercial arbitration generally and you can look through them and try to find examples uh, or, or lack thereof that might be useful to your client's position in the in the case to come and Council like myself and, and many others, I'm sure, look through these to, to find opportunities and, and to find examples of individuals who may be uh, appropriate to appoint in any given case. I mean, just coming back to the point that Gabriel mentioned previously, that obviously you would be surprised sometimes, even if you think that you have vetted someone and you believe that roughly you understand their positions, it might be that the positions in the light of the specific interpretation of the treaty or in the light of the certain factual matrix comes to a different, lands to different position. Have you had experiences in practice where you thought that, you know, you've gone through relatively an extensive research to make sure that an arbitrator um, views things in certain ways um, and eventually um, to find out that Possibly the position is not something that was reflected in the final award. You can always be surprised. Uh, and, and one thing that Giselle mentioned earlier that I thought was interesting was talking about uh, questions and, and comments within a hearing that exhibit or potentially illustrate a, a form of partiality to a view or a party. And I've seen situations in which arbitrators will almost advertise that for the benefit of the appointing party, but then go into deliberations and be quite nuanced and, uh, and balanced and be very careful in how they approach the case. So, and, and that gets into an interesting question of whether, uh, whether the appearance of, of impartiality is, is 
more important or less important than actual impartiality when it comes down to the decision making. But you can be surprised all the time because arbitrators are not necessarily giving a lot of way. And in fact, over the past 10 years, I feel like there has been a move to give even less away, whether it's guidance to the parties as to how a tribunal might be thinking about a question or, or guiding across in a way that a judge might in, a, in an adversarial system. So there's, there's definitely been a cultural shift in the sorts of tips and clues you get, at least from my perspective. And in, in turn, you may well be surprised by the rulings you get. Monty, if I could pick up on a point you made and also a point Giselle made earlier on, on appearance of bias. So Giselle, you made um, the point that often parties are looking for an arbitrator who you know, can ensure that their party, their, ensure that their party's case is heard or understood. We, the, there's comments have been made that an arbitrator being an advocate, however, is not acceptable. So it's important that the arbitrator makes sure that the party's case is understood, but if they tip over into being an advocate, that is not acceptable. It seems to be quite a muddy line to draw. So how do you draw that distinction? How do you tell when they step into being an advocate for the party? Well, I mean, it, it's it's hard to illustrate without the specifics of a case. But as I say, I've I've definitely seen it, and I think it's about how open the question is. Uh, and I I, I I suppose I would. Uh, I would draw a parallel with, you know, a type of cross-examination style question, you know, you, you get, you know, the, the advocate arbitrator will, uh, you know, will ask questions in a certain way, which, which suggests that they are, it's not just putting the other side's case to, to, to the party that they're questioning, but it's, it's exhibiting a particular predisposition to that um, to, to that uh, case theory. And again, it, it's really hard to illustrate uh, kind of theoretically. All I can say is that you definitely know it when you see it and you can definitely see the difference between you know, the, the arbitrator that's just trying to help, you know, help their party along by asking a, an open question, but without exhibiting any predisposition of their own, uh, as opposed to the uh, advocate arbitrator asking that, that very kind of biased, we say in French, orienté question, orientated question uh, to, the, to the other side. If, if I could comment uh, on that, because uh, I think it's an interesting point, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we always think about you know, judges being the ideal of independence and impartiality and, and compare it to arbitrators, but in certain legal cultures, even in the US, for instance, you, you have uh, judges that can be very active and even aggressive in how they, they question both counsel and sometimes witnesses or experts. And that is uh, very much uh, or can be uh, uh, similar to a cross-examination. And actually, I think that sometimes it's, it's helpful for the case that the judge or arbitrator be very active uh, and you know take strong uh, um, view on certain points in, in the sense of asking questions that are, may, might be difficult for, for the witness or, or expert or, or the parties. Uh, and that can be helpful for, for the case in certain cases. So I, I of course there is a, a difficult line as Anna was, was suggesting to draw because um, the arbitrator should not be uh, you know, pushing for, uh, for uh, the case of, of, of any of the parties. But on the other hand, I don't think we want arbitrators that are, are too passive, that are, you know, afraid of, of uh, putting, uh, you know, good questions or difficult questions to the parties or experts because that this might appear as, as prejudging. So uh, it's difficult to find the, uh, the, 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 the right balance, but uh, I, I would uh, encourage arbitrators to, uh, if they want to ask a question, just make the question and, uh, because in the end, that's your role as well. I, I think that's a valid point, uh, Gabriel, and that is, I think, links to something that Mondi mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, that there is this experience that arbitrators have become a little bit more uh, reticent in the way that they, they're more conscious, not to give away too many things. And I think the point that you made, Gabriel, about uh, judges um, in many jurisdictions actively engaging with the parties, uh, making comments, during submissions and giving away some of the thinking 
um, of the judiciary, or at least their personal thinking, uh, can be helpful. But do do you regret this um, this approach, very careful approach, on the part of arbitrators? Do you think that, from your view as counsel, you would welcome a little bit of more insight in their thinking as to what is their main concerns with your case, even if sometimes the way that they express this thinking may may come across as a little bit um, not aggressive, but uh, too intrusive during your submissions? Or do you think that you prefer to know, you know, they have an entirely neutral tribunal also in terms of how they exhibit their neutrality during uh, your submissions? I, I personally, I prefer more active tribunals. And uh, I, I think, well, um, there is a tendency sometimes of, of seeing, you know, very passive tribunals. And perhaps it's part due to what everybody says about the due process paranoia. Uh, and uh, because after all, I mean, as, as when, when you are counsel and, and you see a party appointed, the arbitrator appointed by the other party being uh, too active, you sometimes, of course, won't like it and it's understandable. But um, but I think that in the end, um, counsel is there to help the arbitrators to arrive at, at the correct decision uh, and thus um, to, uh, you know, get questions from the tribunal just to know what they're thinking about, what they need to know. I think it's useful. So, uh, so I actually, I, again, I, I prefer arbitrators that are more active, that make questions, even at some point, uh, even as you say, giving away certain lines of thought. I've had a specific experience in which uh, it's this is public, but I, I won't mention the case. But in which uh, there was a clear prejudgment. So in that case, on, on the very final merits of the case. Well, in that case, of course, that's going too far. But otherwise, I think uh, suggesting lines of thought by the arbitrators for for the parties to engage with and and uh, to enrich the discussion. I think that's a desirable uh, thing to do. Any comments from Giselle or Monty on that, from your perspective as counsel, to whether you would welcome a more active engagement uh, from tribunals, so it's something that you would start being concerned or indeed paranoid, as um, Gabriel said? Uh, <clears throat> well, personally, I, I love active tribunals because questions is what makes the hearing exciting and, and dynamic. Uh, and, and I think... Uh, I absolutely agree with Gabriel, uh, arbitrators should not be concerned about asking too many questions. And I think, you know, what, what you see uh, sometimes, I'd say, particularly with English arbitrators, because it's, it's, what they're, it's what they're used to, you know, they just pepper you with questions throughout your submissions. They might, you know, not necessarily interfere with your line of questionings, but jump, jump in, you know, have no compulsion about jumping in. Um, but you know, when that's done appropriately, you know, appropriately testing each side's case to the nth degree, then, then obviously that's, that's entirely desirable and, and appropriate. I think you know, what's more disappointing is, is if you have you know, an arbitrator that is uh, passive most of the time, except to ask two or three questions that elicit some form of bias or predisposition to a particular thesis. So I think you know when you're when you're asking questions, I I think it's it's important to be seen to be asking open questions of both parties and to be seen to be testing both parties' cases. Not much to add, except I agree, but I don't think it'll change much. Depending, I think it depends upon the background of the arbitrators, as Giselle mentioned, and their natural inclinations. But there is such a concern about being seen to have prejudged even a small argument or, or giving some crumb of a concern to the parties that you it's frustrating when you can brief an issue for years and have no idea what the tribunal is thinking and then an award comes out that's based on one tiny niche of and yeah. of the of the argument and the rest hasn't been either well it, it may have been considered I'm sure it had been but didn't necessarily feature prominently in their reasoning so it's very useful but I'm not sure if we'll necessarily see that much of it and it's quite funny I find when you have different tribunal members exhibiting different styles so you might have one entirely impassive arbitrator and another who gives thumbs up to the council after they finish cross-examinations and not ideal entertaining though 
Yes, I'm sure it can be entertaining. Um, I, I guess that brings up another line of questions. Uh, to what extent this paranoia uh, from arbitrators is justified? And to what extent this translates to the actual numbers of challenges that we've seen lately in international arbitration? And there's a, a general view that challenges have increased, especially in the context of ISDS, because of the uh, sensitive nature of the disputes and the fact that um, there's too much at stake. I wonder whether uh, you agree with the position uh, that challenges against arbitrators have increased lately, and if um, yes, why that would be the case. Gabriel? Well, based on uh, on a consideration of the um, decisions on, on challenges uh, that are public over the last 10 years, uh, I, I don't see a significant increase in the number of challenges. Actually, I've seen an increase in the first five years, so up to, if you will, 2015, more or less, but then uh, the numbers decrease again, and, and we are now uh, roughly, uh, you know, again, based on, on the um, uh, public um, decisions on challenges, roughly where we were 10 years ago. So um, I don't think there is a significant increase in the number of challenges. Uh, however, I, I would say that uh, there is um, a, a change in the, the way in which arbitrators are uh, uh, addressing certain uh, potential concerns regarding partiality and independence. Clearly, and this relates to the first point we addressed, arbitrators are nowadays uh, much more careful when they disclose, uh, you know, whatever links they, they have. Um, and I think this is a desirable uh, evolution. When I started, well, almost 20 years ago or so, um, this, you know, uh, disclosures were not very detailed and um, often arbitrators would simply not disclose points because they thought that they didn't have to, which are now clearly disclosable. So I, I, I see a very clear line in arbitrators uh, disclosing more and more, particularly the last five years, I would say, you see, you know, people saying, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, we worked together in, in a case with this person 20 years ago, which, you know, uh, wouldn't be, uh, I would, in principle, not relevant at all, but still people disclose it. And I think this is, again, a desirable uh, evolution because it's good for parties to know, to have, you know, a reasonable amount of information of the relevant facts. On the other hand, I think this might lead in the future to more challenges because as parties have more information, they, they will be tempted to, to challenge or, or object. Uh, and that's where I think one needs to, or I hope that we will, you know, whoever has to decide on challenges will use a reasonable judgment because, uh, of course, this de depends on, on very much on the facts of each case. But, uh, for example, we've seen now uh, challenges relating to uh, the links between arbitrators and not, not with the parties or their counsel, but more with other actors like uh, experts or so. And in that case, uh, that's, uh, of course, interesting. Uh, but on the other hand, it uh, it risks uh, perhaps uh, you know um, uh, allowing for uh, unjustified challenges. For instance, the the system of, of my firm will not tell me uh, you know who were the experts involved in all the cases we've had, and also take into account that, uh, for example, the same company for ex for example providing valuation services might be if you if you are in a big law firm, this the same company might be providing valuation services for arbitration and for antitrust and for many other, uh, you know, legal services. So actually partners in your firm uh, who you have no idea about might be also using the same company. Uh, and that's, so again, uh, I think it's, it's good for arbitrators to disclose, uh, you know, much more than what they used to. But then I think it's for, for the, the person deciding the challenge or the institution deciding the challenge to be reasonable in, in what are the links that are really problematic? Uh, what are the and what other links are just uh, you know reasonable in, in in the professional world in which we live? Gabriel, you raise a number of very interesting points, both in relation to regulation and how extensive disclosures have been made in in uh, the last years, uh, but also 
and we'll come back to that if, if you may. But I want to ask Mondi in the meantime, and again, giving his um, excellent experience as a counsel in, in a big law firm, how easy, or I should say how difficult it is for a law firm and a client to take the decision at some point to bring a challenge against an arbitrator. Again, I am conscious that it's probably one of the most difficult decisions to, to consider, but I wonder whether you can give us some insight uh, into the process and the thinking that goes behind a decision to challenge an arbitrator, or indeed sometimes the three members of the tribunal. Happy to. To provide some context, I have never been on a case where a client of mine has challenged an arbitrator. Right. Uh, so that right. probably answers part right. of your question. And particularly in the ICSID context, because the standard is so high and because it's baked into the convention and functionally can't change, it's a very tough ask to put that in front of the tribunal and then uh, yeah. in front of the ICSID itself to decide upon. And it's, it's almost a nuclear option. And yeah. to do so creates enormous risk for your client as a general rule. It may be necessary in a given case. And I don't mean to suggest that it's never advisable or appropriate in certain circumstances, but usually for most counsel, I would imagine their experience has been, you raise it with the tribunal member in question, the tribunal in question, as an issue rather than as a formal challenge and you see how one reacts and and go from there but as i said it's it's rare in my experience and i would be very hesitant to do so except in some quite extreme circumstances Giselle, maybe you have um a case where you actually as counsel decided uh, even though reluctantly to do that. And if you're not, and I'm sure whether you have discussed it, and again, I eventually decided not to do. I mean, my, my experience really chimes with Monty's. I think it is a nuclear option and it's uh, something, you know, it's, it's a weapon that you <laughs> use with a lot of caution. Uh, and I personally uh, haven't uh, been involved in, in challenging an arbitrator. Um, what I would say is I think, and I don't want to generalize here, it's sort of my, my view is, is perhaps somewhat anecdotal, but I, I see the kind of challenge weapon uh, as being deployed more frequently by, you know, I, I suppose, uh, counsel that come from more diverse backgrounds. So I think, you know, people who are really embedded in the arbitration community yeah, you know, understand how difficult it is to, to raise these challenges and, and their likely outcome, which is that they're likely to get declined. But you do see a lot of arbitrations being run by lawyers who are not uh, specialists in the field, who are less embedded in the community, less concerned about perhaps their professional relationships and, and perhaps less aware of the likelihood of the challenge or who just don't care, they just, just want to you know, their client wants this, wants to do this, so they go ahead and do it. Uh, and, and, and I mean, that, that's an impression I get from a lot of the case law that you see, particularly, you know, going through the French courts, uh, you know, it, it's because it, it, you, you do see some really, really uh, creative challenges and, and most of the time and, and challenges that obviously happen at the uh, you know, in, in the context or at the post-award stage, you know, in the context of annulment proceedings, uh, for example, uh, and and at that point, it, it's it's really just being used as a tactical weapon, uh, as some something to you know perhaps delay the inevitable uh, outcome of the award, uh, and and you know most most of the time uh, these challenges fail. Uh, but uh, but they are made nonetheless. And I think just to pick up on what Gabriel was saying, the question of disclosure is always really fertile ground in this context because obviously, you know, the, it, it's always hard to to demonstrate a lack of partiality, right, in the context of proceedings. But but if you can uh, find a hook through you know disclosures that perhaps should or should not have been made. Uh, then, then, then that's 
uh, going to provide fertile ground for litigation. And I, what, what I would say is perhaps the number of challenges statistically hasn't necessarily increased proportion to the number of cases, but my uh, kind of anecdotal impression at least is that the challenges are becoming on, on disclosure are becoming more and more creative in terms of raising issues with you know, arbitrators having acted as counsel for a party 30 years ago or someone having supervised you know, a count, member of the council team's doctoral thesis and, and that sort of thing. I and mean, there are some pretty crazy, crazy points uh, being, being raised out there. Zizel, I think you, you raised a point that I think reflects also a position taken by Monty that you said, well, those that come from outside the system, counselor come from outside the system is more likely to challenge, whereas those that um, are very well familiar with the system know how uh, high the threshold um, uh, for a challenge uh, is to be met. And I think that's also what Mondi said. He said that, you know, especially in the exit, it's very difficult to successfully challenge an arbitrator. And I wonder whether, Mondi, you, the comment that you made there, and then Zizel's comment actually reflects a view that the threshold should be become lower. So in other words, is it the fact that the threshold is too high that prevent many challenges from being brought, although there should be merits in those challenges, or the fact that you think that um, there isn't usually merit in any challenge whatsoever? Well, uh, the, the exit standard isn't ever changing uh, because it's in the convention rather than the rules. Uh, so with 100% amendment requirement, of course, we're, we're stuck with manifest whether you like it or not. So there's a level of, I think, at least in the ICSID context, uh, it is, I don't think it's viable to, to hope for a change. But to answer your question as to in other contexts or even within the ICSID context, whether if that standard was changed, there would likely be a greater number of challenges. I'm still not so sure. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you would have to have a fairly high degree of confidence about the success rate of a challenge before you commenced it because of the potential consequences for your client's case on that tribunal if the challenge is unsuccessful. And that's always the concern that, that animates you or at least the, the, the check and balance, check or balance uh, to the uh, consideration as to whether a challenge is merited. So. It will always be dependent upon the circumstances. I would never say that a challenge would never be advisable, but you always have to, as, as a representative of a party, think, well, what, what are the risks? Even if you could say quite uh, coherently and cogently that the circumstances in question meet the standard, that's not the, the entirety of the consideration. If I could put up, pick up on a point which Giselle made and, and also Monty alluded to that, Challenging an arbitrator is very much the nuclear option. Are there any types of behavior or any types of connections which bring you closer to this nuclear option? And perhaps if I could ask that of, of, of Gabrielle. Well, um, as, uh, as, uh, I, I, I agree that it's a very difficult um, decision to, to take, uh, to, to challenge an arbitrator, but, but there are certain circumstances in which, in which uh, one should consider challenging an arbitrator. And, and actually, uh, it's interesting because as, as Monty was saying, uh, of course, the, the, the standard in, in the exit proceedings is in the convention. Uh, however, uh, if I look back uh, in the first exit cases, there was a discussion whether uh, the, the, you know, the applicable uh, standard was actual bias or appearance of bias. And that was, I think, um, you know, clarified by the chairman of the uh, Administrative Council in, in some of the decisions, more recent decisions, the last 10 or 15 years, in the sense that um, uh, the applicable standard is uh, appearance of bias. And, and that effectively means, I, I would argue, a higher 
um, a more demanding standard of independence and impartiality for, for arbitrators. Uh, so in that light, uh, of course, there are situations in, in which you have, um, you know, undisclosed um, relationships between the arbitrators and, and the parties or, or council, which are, it depends, of course, on, on how intense they are, whether they are uh, current or not, but there might be cases in which, in which uh, of course, a challenge might be justified. Again, I'm, I'm more skeptical about issue conflicts and about uh, when, you know, when the arbitrator has uh, opined or decided in a certain way. In, in other cases, that, I think, uh, except for very extreme cases, I, I would tend to think that those do not justify a challenge. From, from, from our discussion now, um, more than an hour, I get the sense that um, A, the system is, is well regulated. B, the people that practice in the system are very well aware of what is expected of them. And largely they behave reasonably uh, well. And certainly um, in, uh, more often than not uh, in Barsha. So I wonder, just to go back to the initial observations that I made, what is it then that justifies these wide and loud voices against ISDS um, uh, impartiality? Is it justifiable? Is it something that we tend to react, including with the new code of conduct to something that doesn't necessarily reflect what actually takes takes place in in in, in practice. Moni, I can see that you're smiling. Maybe it's either you 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 don't want to answer the question or you you want to answer the question. And oh, I'm I'm I don't know. Throw, I'm eager to throw in my thoughts, but I'd like to see Gabriel. Please do. Okay, fair enough. Gabriel. No, I, I think that uh, my view, if, if I compare the, the present reality of investment arbitration to what it was again 15 years ago or so, I think uh, there have been improvements in the sense at least that we have a more transparent system in certain ways. Again, we spoke about, uh, you know, um, um, more demanding disclosure requirements. Uh, for example, uh, ICSID itself at the beginning or, uh, you know, when I started, when uh, ICSID would decide a challenge, it wouldn't provide reasons. Uh, nowadays, when ICSID uh, decides some challenges, they always provide reasons. I, I see that as a clear improvement. So, oh, very good point. so, so I think uh, there were some valid concerns and there have been improvements. Um, but uh, of course, some concerns and some criticisms are not justified, but somewhere, and, I, and I, I'm happy to see some improvements. And I, I, I'm still, I still think there are, there's room for improvement still, and we should work on that. I myself think, uh, going to the body autonomy, think uh, that um, uh, some kind of, of appeal mechanism in, in the uh, context of investment arbitration is um, a, a way in which some of these problems could be resolved. Again, I'm not in favor of a full-blown permanent uh, tribunal, but some kind of appeal mechanism uh, coupled with, uh, you know, party appointment at the first level could be a way forward. But, uh, but again, some of the concerns were, were valid, and I think some improvements have been. Mondi, now, your sure. turn. Thank, you're, not thank going, you. you're not getting away with it. No, 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 I, I don't plan to. I, I, I've just been thinking that there's, there's an elegant mirror here between the idea of actual and perception, both in terms of, of, of bias and partiality, but also in what is considered legitimate, because we come at this question as international arbitration practitioners, academics, arbitrators, and we see the idea of, I would assume, I don't want to speak for all of you, but I tend to see the three uh, three member tribunal with one party appointing each and the chair being chosen through agreement of some sort to be quite an elegant way of, of ensuring that there is balance and that each side gets a choice. And it also in, ensures 
I think, legitimacy of the outcome where the parties have had a role in, in choosing the, the body that then decides the case. And that, of course, goes back to our understanding of what arbitration is being a consensual agreement based uh, dispute resolution mechanism. But people outside of the world of arbitration might come to this and say, an investor gets to choose their own judge. Uh, and you think of someone going down to the commercial courts and saying, I'd like that one. That feels offensive and, and problematic, potentially, depending upon your background. So whilst we may sitting here think that as a matter of fact, there may not be actual concerns on our part as to impartiality issues within the investment arbitration uh, system. It doesn't, does it really matter in the sense that it's about the perception of it? And if a court is considered to have greater legitimacy in the eyes of those who matter, and that's the states and, and those who appoint governments, uh, and, and of course other uh, decision makers and, and players in this space as well, then perhaps that's preferable. I mean, if I look at a court, I think, well, if you've got one of the participants appointing or potential prospective participants in an arbitration appointing all of the decision makers, that is a less balanced system, arguably, than having both sides appointing. But the commercial court system works well in many, many countries and the state is appointing them and depending upon the background. So I, I, I enjoy that that play between perception and, and actual because I think it, it's relevant to how we look at this issue. If I could pick up Monty on your point about perception, that le that links in nicely with a question we've had from the audience from Atil Nedin Yovitil, who essentially has asked that, um, I, mean, I, I assume that if an arbitrator has made any disclosure which may cause a reasonable apprehension of bias among the parties, the arbitrator would recuse himself from hearing the matter. So this concern about if there's any disclosure which causes a reasonable apprehension of bias and the arbitrator should step down. Giselle, maybe if I could bring you in there. Well, I mean, I think in practice, that's what happens quite often uh, because the arbitrator feels that he no longer has the confidence of of both parties and, and cannot continue and the, the risk of future challenges is too great so so I think I think that does actually happen um, but uh, but again you're, you're relying on perhaps the the conscience and the and the concerns of the individual arbitrator is that is that enough uh, but then you you obviously have the formal challenge mechanism if you need to but recusals do happen very often when no, challenge, when, when concerns are raised can I follow up on uh, the very thoughtful comments that Monty made and the distinction there between what's actually happening and the perception of the public, including people that are not very well familiar with the system. <clears throat> and I absolutely agree, this is, this is a valid distinction. And I see how uh, the public may view a field um, that is, they're not very well familiar with. But this brings the question as to how one should respond to that. If you think that there's nothing that justifies this perception, but nevertheless, you acknowledge this perception as being valid, it seems to me that there are two different courses of action. One is to inform better those that are not very well familiar and bring them in line with what actually happens including bringing some evidence-based assessments, or you say, I cannot win this fight and I'll just try and move all together from what's actually happening. Although I don't think that is necessarily what should happen because in the first place, the system is not as biased as people perceive it to be. And it seems to me that in many ways we have chosen to do the latter rather than the former. Is it a valid assessment, Giselle and Gabriel, of what actually had, had gone into international arbitration as a matter of responding to the largely critical public discourse in the last 10, 15 years? Mm. Uh, it, it's interesting you raise this point. I've, I've actually heard a lot of the arguments from the uninitiated. And in fact, there was a whole 
evening program, sort of the French equivalent of Panorama, dedicated a couple of years ago to these awful secret tribunals that, uh, you know, end up in uh, awards of billions of dollars against states based on spurious grounds. And I mean, I just sat through it all fuming at the inaccurate portrayal of the whole process. Um, we've seen that, we've seen this award, <laughs> and I just out of disclosure, they had a cam to take some interviews and comments from one of the uh, events that we made uh, many years ago uh, in Washington uh, in the ITA ASU uh, on third party funding. And as you know, third party funding was another big uh, yeah. red herring there. And they interviewed us and just very selectively portraying some of the comments. Mm. So, yeah, you're right. Mm. I mean, what do you do about that? But, but it is, it's permeating through to the decision makers. I mean, we've, we've heard you know, government ministers espouse, espouse these views. Obviously, the European Commission says ISDS is dead. Um, and, and I think, unfortunately, the whole discussion about impartiality of, of you know, investment tribunals is, is sort of wrapped up with the substance of the issue, which is our rights and obligations under investment treaties sufficiently balanced as between states and investors. Uh, and, and, and so I think it, it's hard to separate uh, the, the two debates. You know, everything gets the, the process, if you like, even if we think that the process is, is largely well regulated and, and self corrects itself when, when needed, that doesn't, you know, result in any, you know, untransparent, uh, you know, unlawful, unbiased result, unfair results, uh, that the problem is that the discussion about the process gets wrapped in with the substance, which is, are these investment treaties sufficiently balanced? And of course, there's a huge amount of work being done by states to, to rebalance their investment treaties, but it's, it's really hard to separate the, the two issues, I think. So in a sense, it feels as if now just tinkering around with the process is not going to address the public concerns that are raised. Something more radical needs to happen. And I would also add, I think there needs to be more communication between our communities and the general public. Uh, I think that the general public is, is quite misinformed, but we also as a community are a bit too insular. We like to have our discussions among ourselves, but we're not very good at going out there and uh, you know, explaining, educating the general public. Uh, it's very interesting, Giselle, thank you. Gabriel, what do you think? I mean, you mentioned, coming back to the point that Giselle made, um, that you need something radical. So the question is how, how radical you need to be to address this. And you mentioned the point about an appellate mechanism, although you said that um, a tribunal in the first instance uh, can still operate very well. Do you think that this would address uh, concerns surrounding lack of impartiality of ISDS system? I think that uh, it's a good, good point that Giselle made at the end uh, about us being insular in, in the sense that I, I found it, you know, some of the practitioners would um, would say that everything is perfect, there's no problem, we should, we have to make no changes. And I think that attitude was problematic because uh, then, uh, of course, I think some of the criticisms were valid uh, and that puts uh, the, the system at, at risk if you, if you don't want to, to make any changes. On the other hand, I'm not sure if we need radical changes, although one might say that creating an appellate mechanism is a radical change, so that uh, depends on how you define that. But I do think that if uh, hopefully we're able to, to um, uh, devise a, an appeal mechanism that is, again, reasonable and keeps some of the good things of, 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 of the current system, even party appointment at, at the first instance, uh, I think it could, it could address some, some of the concerns, including uh, regarding independence and impartiality. And, and sorry, ju just to clarify, when I was talking about radical changes, I, I wasn't really talking about tinkering around with the process. And I, I tend to agree with Gabriel that an appellate mechanism is, is, is you know, would, would be probably a positive development given what's at stake here. Uh, I was talking more about how you rebalance uh, investment treaties 
on the, you know, on the substantive rights and obligations to give to general public confidence that uh, uh, these are not just uh, vulture funds and, and investors uh, coming in to, to strip states of their assets and uh, destroying the environment in parallel. Sorry, I'm, this is not what I believe. I'm just uh, paraphrasing what the general public says about investment treaties. I think Monty has a comment. <laughs> Oh, we would yes, welcome I, that. <laughs> it was just on the the point that that Stavros originally made, or the question he posed about whether it is incumbent upon the industry to communicate and to attempt to educate. And one thing I, I always go back to is, and there may be people who've worked at ICSID or or people who live in Washington who've seen this, uh, but there's this giant inflatable fat cat, a corporate fat cat that they pop outside the World Bank every time there's a a controversial ISDS hearing that's on and it's often hired by NGOs and you'll, you would have seen it in GAR articles and it's got this cat in a suit and he's crushing workers of the world in one hand and he's got a big cigar in the other hand with a fistful of dollars somewhere tucked away. I think he even, have, even has a, a fob watch coming out of his top pocket but it's such a visceral and powerful symbol of the position that the anti-ISDS movement have. It's the simplest form of an idea and it's very difficult to to educate against that, I feel, in the sense of let's go back to the underpinnings of ICSID and the desire to, to promote and protect international foreign direct investment. And when you're faced with something visceral and something symbolic, it can be very difficult to do. So as much as I sometimes wonder whether the, the reform movement is potentially going too far, and I, I don't have a strong view on that, uh, it makes sense to me that there is an, an effort to give credence and, and to try and implement incorporate these concerns because it's very difficult to to destabilize a view once once held given it is such a, a visceral and, and powerful message that's being uh, being put forward well thank you thank you monty i think the system has been beaten comprehensively by a fat cut um but we we may we may be thinking of ways to um, to educate as well as uh, taking the necessary steps uh, to address some of the valid concerns. Because obviously, you know, I was uh, oversimplifying when I said that there's um, all has to do with perception. I don't think the point that you were making, Monty, was that everything has to do with perception. I think obviously reality is more nuanced. Uh, you tend to look very hard and uh, honestly into what hasn't been working including in um, the conduct of uh, arbitrators, some arbitrators at least, uh, and trying to address that as, again, as I say, ICSID and uh, the ANSITRO have, have done recently with the introduction of the new code of conduct. But at the same time, I think, when you feel strongly that the system hasn't been as bad as, you, as people perceive it to be, uh, you probably try and find ways to, um, to defend the position and make sure that um, uh, reality catches up with perception rather than the other way around. Um, any, any final comment? I'm conscious that we are just uh, have uh, come to the end, although I can see there are a couple of questions. I don't know, maybe, maybe Anna has been following these questions more closely than I had. Yes, we have a couple of questions that have recently come in and one takes us back to the early discussion about that muddy distinction between an arbitrator making sure that the case is heard and understood compared to becoming an arbitrator sort of advocate. And the question comes from Dennis Parcher, Jev, who asks, how does one fight an arbitrator who does not shy away from asking loaded questions? We hear that challenging an arbitrator is a nuclear option. What's the best course of action? I think Monty, you touched upon this earlier about saying there are other ways of addressing this rather than addressing potential uh, suggestions of bias rather than bringing a, an actual challenge. So what are the best courses of action to address an, ar it, an arbitrator advocate? It's, uh, the situation I was thinking about was more in the context of a relationship or former work or, or some, uh, some connection that might give rise to a perception of, of bias or a lack of independence that would ordinarily prompt a letter uh, to the tribunal or to the institution, to the arbitrator, uh, drawing their attention to the issue and suggesting 
very gently that it may not be appropriate to continue. In the context of a hearing, when, when you're actually getting loaded questions, I don't think there's really any other strategy except to answer the questions and to do so as politely and, and, and as effectively as you can. And then there's a question as to whether you need to push back and protect a position and, and make a, a suggestion within a hearing. But again, that's, that's a, a difficult, difficult one to answer in the abstract because it will be entirely fact and situation dependent. I just very briefly add to what uh, Mondi says, and I think that's very sensible. At the same time, I ha um, however, I should say uh, that if you, if council is faced with this situation, that they had to decide whether to actually uh, move ahead with a nuclear option or politely suggesting that this is not appropriate, I think that's also a failure on the part of the presiding arbitrator, because it seems to me that it's a campaign upon the presiding arbitrator to make sure that neither of the two party appointed arbitrators in the way that they pose questions or they conduct themselves, bring counsel in a position that they would feel uncomfortable. And, and therefore, you know, the question is, what do you do with a presiding arbitrator? But I think it's important to have a presiding arbitrator that is conscious of the balances and the sensitivities uh, surrounding the uh, party appointed arbitrator's behavior and conduct during the hearing and if they believe that this had been, um, they have crossed the line, that somehow the presiding arbitrator uh, makes sure that they are, are brought back into the right position. There's one last yes. question. Um, I'll just touch upon, it's quite a long question, so I'll just touch upon the last part of it from Hikari Saito. And at the end of her question, she asks, are parties keen on appointing someone who supports them in the arbitration proceeding, even if they are biased? And do arbitrators feel pressured to do so? So this is an interesting point here. Do, do the arbitrators feel pressured to, to support, to lean towards the party that appointed them? Gabrielle, maybe if I could bring you in. Yes. Uh, well, I, I guess that depends on, on each arbitrator, but I, I don't think that as a general matter, arbitrators uh, uh, feel that they are obliged to to, to act in, in that way. But again, there are arbitrators that do think that the, their duty is also to make sure that they present their, the, the party that appointed them, um, the, the, the arguments in, in a complete way. And I have seen that done in, in deliberations. Uh, so, uh, and, and to be fair, I think it's preferable if uh, arbitrators are open as to the way in which they see their roles rather than having people pushing for certain hidden agenda. So yeah, I, I always prefer that, that to be honest and transparent. Unless there is any other comments, anything further to be made by Zolo, Monty, a last parting shot. Well, then, then it's on us to thank you again, sincerely for taking the time, um, virtually appearing um, at Queen Mary and the School of International Arbitration for uh, sharing your uh, experience, your insights into um, the minds of our arbitrators, tribunals and council. Um, uh, I always feel uh, grateful uh, to people um, that um, they take the time, as I said, uh, from uh, very busy schedules to, um, to share their thoughts. And I don't know, I mean, when, when we did that in the old fashioned way, uh, where we appear in person, we would uh, sign off with a round of applause. I don't know how we can upload you here and how we can um, show our appreciation. I think there might be a funny um, emoji that does that, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, so I would just very notionally just applaud you all and thank you sincerely for, for everything and uh, for sharing your thoughts. Um, and we very much look forward to the next time around to have you in person and then be able to uh, be in the same place in London, which is remarkably sunny here. As you can see from Mondi's now, the sun <laughs> has just now turned um, his face and we would then... Um, go out and, uh, and uh, have a nice round of drinks with, with the participants. But we'll have to wait for another year for that. In the meantime, thank you again very much. 
And thank you also to the audience that stay with us all this time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You very Bye. Much. Bye.